Let me, let me start with the U.S. Uh, said the increased NATO troop presence reaction to Russian provocative military exercises. Mm -hmm. Russia, on the other hand, says uh, it's exercised partly because of increased NATO presence. So we got one saying this, and right. uh, the message is obviously converging. So how do you come up with a compromise? You were once the NATO ambassador, or do sure. you? Or is I, I don't see any reason to try to compromise with Russian propaganda. I mean, they just spew this stuff out in order to make a case that's not based on anything factual. So if you look at what happened since the end of the Cold War, uh, you had countries that have been occupied by the Soviet Union become free, independent, want to be secure. Uh, they all joined NATO because they wanted to feel secure and not have to deal with Russian uh, aggression or occupation again. And frankly, that was very successful. So you have 100 million people who now live in free societies that are secure. NATO, because there wasn't any Russian threat during this time, dramatically reduced its defense capabilities, its defense spending. Every defense secretary that I can remember has been complaining about the decline in NATO defense capabilities and defense spending. Russia, meantime, has built itself back up. It's invaded a couple of its neighbors. It's annexed Crimea. It's exercised in very large numbers just east of NATO territory. It's buzzed our warships. It's violated people's airspace. So NATO, as a result of this, is saying, well, we're going to have to put a little bit more in place so that our commitment to collective defense, should it ever be tested, is known to be real. But it's still tiny numbers compared to anywhere where we were in the last 10 years, or, or especially not during the Cold War. Jim? Well, I, I would not say it was a success uh, expanding NATO up to Russia's borders. If you look at how does this enhance U.S. security, I don't think it does at all. I think it endangers American security to be handing out war guarantees like they were making Facebook friends. Uh, this notion that somehow the Russians are aggressive for moving troops around within their own borders, that the Russians are aggressive because, what, they've moved their borders up to our NATO allies? Uh, I, I think we have behaved very provocatively at the end of the Cold War when Russia, I think, reasonably expected with the end of communism, we were all going to be friends. And then they see what happened not only with the expansion of NATO, but with the NATO war against Yugoslavia, which I know from many people I talked to in Russia had been violently pro-American before that. And then they said, now we see what you're really about, that all the things the Soviet Union said about you, which we thought were lies then, were true. And as far as these, uh, the, the, these buzzing our ships and planes, if Russian spy planes or Chinese spy planes and ships were 50 miles away from Norfolk or San Diego, you don't think our planes would go out there and leave their calling card and say, boy, it's a little far from home, ain't you? Uh, as far as the, you know, the, these talk about this as being dangerous and so forth, my father's a retired fire pilot, former air attache in Moscow. I talked to him about this. And he said, look, you know, when we used to go up and intercept Soviet planes that got near our airspace, how, clo how close would you get to them? He said, feet. Yeah, this, is, this is part of what you, you do, unfortunately, when we have a new Cold War situation that's been created. Uh, and I wouldn't say it's all uh, our fault, but I would say most of it is our fault. And are I we, think it's a big mistake. Are we going to see more of this buzzing? Well, and how dangerous is so that? So let's go back. So Russia, you know, Georgia is not part of Russian territory. Ukraine's not part of Russian territory. So Russia moving its troops around into other people's countries and annexing, annexing them and occupying them, that's not normal stuff. That's not within their own territory. And in terms of you know, what we're talking about with Central and Eastern Europe, these are independent countries. These are people who are making their own choices about their own countries. It's not some kind of aggression towards Russia. So I think Russia is... Uh, using that as a pretext for its own ambitions, not, uh, not that there's anything that has happened to Russia at all. Uh, as far as buzzing, you know, you're right, during the Cold War, that was what was going on. None of us want to go back to the Cold War, and so we're very concerned to see Russia engaging in this kind of behavior. I have to disagree. I think lots of people would be thrilled to go back to the Cold War. I think that's one reason we're so Russia fixated, for example, on Syria. We can't let the Russians win, let the Assad government stay. We need to help our jihadist terrorist friends take over that country, just like we destroy the government in Libya. As far as Georgia and Ukraine go, of course they're sovereign countries. Nobody in Moscow ever questioned that. However, when you have an extra continental power, namely the United States, saying we now want to bring these countries into a NATO alliance. And remember, they were both invited to join NATO. No, at the one's been invited the, to NATO. The, excuse <laughs> me. The, the, the NATO summit in Bucharest said these countries will be part of NATO. Right, because they sought and, and it was the first step toward, who cares what they sought? We should be caring about what's in the security of our country, not necessarily what somebody in Tallinn or Tbilisi wants. What about uh, the potential for a major crisis in the, in the region? Do you think that, uh, you know, it, it, this escalation, does, d when do we reach a tipping point? Or, or is this just 
posturing? Well, I think what's happening is, is Russia is testing to see whether and when we will react. And to this point, we haven't reacted very much at all. You know, even with the, the buzzing of the destroyers, we didn't do anything. With their invasion of Ukraine, we put on sanctions, but nothing military, no response to that. With Georgia, they're still occupying Georgia eight years after they invaded. So the reaction from the U.S. and, and NATO has been very, very uh, cautious and, and very minimal. And so Russia is testing new things. So what if we do this? What if we do this? Uh, I think when we do see a bit more pushback, and we're starting to see that now, with the, the NATO deciding NATO deciding to put battalions in each of the Baltic states, for instance, to say that we are going to defend the territory of our allies, at least. We're not going to defend Ukraine, but we will, for those countries that are members of NATO and our allies, we will defend their territory if, territory if anything should happen to them. Then I think we're going to start seeing some balance back into this and maybe a little bit more stability. But until the Russians feel that kind of pushback, I think they're going to keep testing. Jim, I saw you shaking your yeah, head. Yeah, I, I think this is more of, a, with all due respect to the ambassador, more simply, let's let's poke the bear and see if we can get a response from him. Uh, I, I don't think it makes any sense. I don't think it adds to the security of our country. And by the way, I would put uh, the U.S. posture in the South China Sea with respect to China in exactly the, the same terms. My hope is, and I was very inspired by Donald Trump's speech the other day, where he said, look, we are going to reach out to the hand of partnership to both Russia and China and see what can be done where our mutual interests uh, coincide. I think it's time to get over this kind of uh, bipartisan, you know, neocon Republican, liberal interventionist, democratic foreign policy that is based on the concept that the United States needs to be the dominant power on every corner of the globe and start respecting other territories in their neighborhood the way we would expect them to respect us here in, in our hemisphere. Let me fire one last question at both of you. A uh, former assistant defense secretary for Obama said recently, when you look at the military exercises, the maritime exercises planned by NATO, it's sending a pretty clear message to Moscow. What do you see that message as? I, I don't think it's a very clear message at all. And I would agree in part with the ambassador on this is that I think there's a mixed signal that we send. On the one hand, we act and talk very provocatively in terms of stepping on Russia's, I would say also China's toes in their own territory. But then that, that is then backed up with an obvious weakness and flaccidity when it comes to, well, what are you going to do about it? Now, I'm not advocating to say, let's follow through so will this follow through with dumb, strong talk, with even dumber, stronger action? My, you know, people keep talking about, you know, Hitler on the march, Putin is Hitler, Hillary likes to use that language. This is not 1939. My fear is it's 1914, that you have powers, uh, in, a, in, in our case, gratuitously, with no real national interest at stake, uh, extending our sphere of influence in a place where we really don't belong. And let me ask you the same question, uh, Kurt, with the caveat that in the past I've heard mm -hmm. you say the Obama's not very good, administration no. not very good at sending messages. No, uh, it's not. Are they in this case? Well, it's, and here I agree with, with our colleague. It's not a clear message for the very same reason that you say. We'll, we'll put a destroyer not into Russian territory or Chinese territory, mm -hmm. in international waters, and the Russians will then buzz that and we don't do anything. So we, we're trying to take a step that says, yes, we're strong, but then our response is not a strong response when Russia does something. But what would you want them to do in that case? If they're buzzing uh, well, a ship in international waters, yeah. the way I claim we would do the same thing if they were near our coast, right. which, what, what, what do we which expect again, them to do exactly? You, know, you, you, you claim that, but yeah. we haven't been doing that. The Russia has been coming down our coast with its, uh, with its bombers and with some uh, destroyers and aircraft, and we haven't. We've been monitoring them. We follow them, but sure. we have not been doing that kind of reckless activity endangering their sailors and our pilots, such as the Russians have just been doing. Uh, and I think you do have to you do have to lock on the radars. You have to be, give them a warning. When Obama calls Putin the next day, you ought to mention this and say, knock it off. And in both of these cases that you raise, China and Russia, what's happened here is not the U.S. failing to offer to work with these countries. That's, in fact, what Obama has done, is he's tried to do the reset with Russia. He's tried to do constructive engagement with China. And he has pulled back U.S. capabilities and what's happened is both Russia and China have moved forward to say, okay, we're going to be more assertive in this territory, China reclaiming islands, building air, air bases in, in disputed territories in the South China Sea, Russia invading Ukraine in 2014. Um, so those things are what's changed. And the U.S. response thus far, or NATO's response, has been very measured. And it, we're starting to see NATO begin to put a little bit more capability on the table to say we're starting to now draw a line. I don't think there was any kind of pulling back at all. If you look at the Obama administration's behavior, I think it was essentially a continuation 
of the Bush administration. If you look with the, the reckless enthusiasm, for example, with the Victoria Nuvland over in Kiev during the change of regime in Ukraine, which somehow in a very divided, very unstable country becomes the Ukrainian people have chosen. How? Through mobs on the street? That's not, that's not democracy. That's not in our national interest to push the Russians like that on their border. The same thing with this rotational thing in, uh, in the Baltic states. Uh, we had agreed in the Russia NATO founding act we would not base NATO forces in the new members east of Germany. And now we're says. playing little games by, oh, we're not basing them there. We're just rotating them through. And we want to spend, what, another half trillion dollars beefing up these forces over there to counter what threat to the United States and to the American people? Zero. Yeah. Well, the, the point here is not only U.S. security. The point is that it's the security of the U.S. and allies because we are part of a larger community of democratic, market-oriented countries that band together for our common security. So that's what NATO's been about since it was founded in 1949. I and, disagree with that as well. Well, that's what yeah. NATO was founded no, it was for. No, it was founded to prevent the Soviet Union, which was a communist state, taking over Western Europe. Well, if, if you look at what NATO was founded for, it's Article 4 of the NATO Treaty, says it will defend the territory of its members against an attack. And we put together a capability to be able to defend. Fortunately, we never had to do that. As countries in Europe that had been occupied by the Soviet Union became free, they wanted to be part of that community too, so they didn't have to worry about their security being taken away from them again. And so they joined as well, and we still have an obligation to all of those NATO members. And as with the original 12 NATO's, uh, NATO members and the, the 28 that we have today, we hope to never have to do that. The whole point is to be strong enough together that no one is threatening that security, so we don't have to engage in any kind of, I, of warfare. I don't think anybody can claim that these new members are in any way contributing to the defense of the United States. They are security consumers. They we to buy, the defense of the alliance. The, it's, it, that, that's a tautology. It's a circular argument. The alliance's purpose is to contribute to the defense of the alliance exactly. by adding new members who can only be defended by the United States, who themselves can contribute nothing to the defense of the United States. Gentlemen, I think we've run no. out of time, but we could probably go on for a lot longer. I want to yeah. thank you both for uh, bringing your energy to the debate. Uh, <laughs> certainly appreciate it. Good. Thank, Great you, to thank, you. thank you, Mike.